Mark chapter 8 takes us in to a part of the life of the Lord Jesus Christ where he's moving towards what is going to happen to him in Jerusalem. And he's doing everything in his power to get his brothers ready. And there is something he keeps saying to them that they keep resisting. Because these are men who've left everything. They left behind what business they had in Galilee and other places. Everything that looked like stability in this world, they walked away from for the Lord Jesus Christ to follow with him. And they had all kinds of expectations that had been set in their mind about what it was they would have as a reward. In their mind, they thought there would be a repetition of what happened during the days of the Maccabees, that this man would lead a massive Jewish resistance against the Romans and boot the Gentiles out, get people like Herod under control, and then establish the kingdom of God that would be like unto the kingdom under David. This is what they were looking for. And they thought, just like as it was with the Maccabees, the, they would inhabit positions of power and authority and influence and, and all those things that they had nothing to do with his kingdom at all. Nothing to do with the work that he was doing at that time anyway. And so the Lord Jesus Christ, it says in verse 31 of chapter 8, began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he spake the saying openly. And Peter took him and began to rebuke him. But he turning about and looking on his disciples rebuked Peter and said, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou savest not the things that be of God, but the things of men. Now, you just think of the emotional cross currents going on in just these few verses in this little situation the Lord Jesus Christ has just been with his brethren and he's been teaching them and leading them through different neighborhoods and then he starts telling them you need to know this I'm going to die I'm going to suffer and these terrible things are going to happen to me Everybody whose support you think I would need to become the Messiah and the King, you think I'm going to become, I'm not going to have. I'll be rejected by the elders. And all those other people who should support me to become the anointed King of Israel, they're not going to give me any of that support. Now, now it seems that what he was saying to them, though he said it openly, was so jarring to them it was so shocking to them. They couldn't let go of what they thought things would be like for the king when he became king. They didn't think any of that would happen. They thought he was going to lead a popular and very successful revolt. What Jesus is giving them is a message that has nothing to do with those things. Nothing at all. And perhaps a, a, a small lesson that we can draw from this for us, is that when we were young and came into the truth, or even when we came into the truth just recently, we had all these expectations of a happy life in Christ. A life that would not have the drama, the struggle, the difficulty of the lives of those we might have seen outside in the world around us, or the lives of people that we were related to. We probably thought that we would hold on in the truth, we'd be a member of Ecclesia, we would love to hear the word of God, we would love to partake of the bread and the wine, and we would then progress smoothly through <coughs> to life in God's kingdom, at the return of Christ, or falling asleep gently into Christ. And instead what our life becomes 
is a time of great struggle, of great disappointment, a litany of trials and tribulations that affect every one of our individual lives. It may hit you in your marriage with all the unhappinesses that can emerge in a difficult marriage. It may hit you with your children and the rebellion, the revolt, the tragic circumstances your children may go through as they go through the stages of growth and development that kids go through. It may hit you in your own personal life, your health, your strength. It may hit you professionally in how hard it is to make a living or the way that your business falls apart if you have your own business or the way that you are rendered redundant after years of service in a company where you've given so much of your life. It may hit you in the recognition that everything that you sacrificed in order to make a prosperous life for your family was not worth it in the end when you saw the actual impact that that life of near luxury compared to what you grew up with has had on your children as they've grown. Our life in the truth also involves struggles in the ecclesia, problems, divisions, conflicts, jarringly different points of view that war against each other and create all manner of disagreement amongst brothers and sisters. Sometimes there, there are lifestyle uh, uh, differences where someone has a lifestyle that is, well, altogether different to someone else's and then there are conflicts that emerge around those things likewise. And yes, we are in this world and experience all the difficulties and challenges of a society that is steadily, incrementally spinning out of control, going downward, deeper and deeper into darkness as we move towards the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. This life in the truth is not an easy one. It never has been an easy one. It has never been a life where we wake up in the morning and everything is going to be roses all the way through that day. There are times of wonderful rejoicing, uplift, encouragement, mostly when we get together and when we're around the Word of God and we hear things from it that really give us something to hold on to. The Lord Jesus knew the work that his disciples would have to do in holding on in a wicked age and in holding the ecclesia together would be excruciatingly difficult. You know, he pulls away Peter, James and John and it's almost as if these are his special friends. No, no, that's not the way it was. When I was a kid I saw it that way. That's not the way it was. What he was doing is he was saying, you three, you're going to go through the ringer because of me and my truth and the truth that I'm giving to you from God. You're going to have to hold the ecclesia together through the worst period after I'm gone. You'll have to deal with the persecutions of the Gentiles, with division inside the ecclesia, with struggles around what the truth is, with wrong doctrines that will come in and you will look at all, all of the difficulty that brothers and sisters will have in their lives as they live and try to live a life so different to the rest of the Gentiles around them. You lot, you three, will have to deal with the havoc of the differences culturally between Jews and Gentiles merged into the same ecclesial situations. And that was not easy. These were men who had to be strengthened so that having seen a vision of glory, they'd have something to pull up in their hearts to give them the encouragement to keep on working. You know, those days as a brother or sister, when you wake up, the ecclesia has been fighting for a while. It's a Sunday morning and the thought crosses your mind, you know, I don't even want to go there. I don't want to be 
around all the conflict and all of the drama of the ecclesia. I think I'll just stay home today. And then that part of your brain, the mind of Christ, says, no, get up and get going. You need to be with your brothers and sisters. In spite of the imperfections of the situation and all the difficulties that you face. Yahweh had shown to those men who had to give such difficult messages to his people who were not anywhere near popular with the people. He'd shown them visions of his glory. Ezekiel saw what he saw, the manifestation, the vision of wonderful figure, Yahweh or the Lord Jesus Christ manifesting Yahweh in a throne and the cherubim and the wheels showing that God was forever at work. There was movement always taking place in the fulfillment of his will, in the implementation of his plan, always in motion, never static and unmoving. And he wasn't the only one who had seen these visions. We know about the visions that John saw, that glorious book at the end of the Bible. We know about Daniel and his visions. We know about Isaiah when he saw that vision of God. All of these were given to strengthen people about to see and experience the most difficult things in their lives. And so it says, after he rebukes him, in verse 34, when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And that word deny means to say no to oneself. It means to step away from a way of thinking where you are at the center of your life and God instead is in the center. What Christ is saying is, I am modeling for you a life where I have to be patient with people and their imperfections. People I have come to save and to heal. Where I, with all of my struggles to remain sinless and all the excruciating difficulty, all of the energy that is required to achieve that, helped by God, supported by God, given the Spirit of God and the Word of God, but with all of that difficulty, I'm showing you. This is the life. This is the life that you're coming into. It is not a life of ease. It's not a life of comfort. It's not a life which is free of trouble and difficulty. And when those difficulties come, and when that trouble slams against your life like a wave, that is what has to be the case. So that you will reach out to, deny yourself, and rely completely on God. As we age, that strong, youthful self-confidence erodes away, doesn't it? That sense that we always have the answers. We know what to do. We can look after ourselves. We know how to solve all the problems that come up. That dwindles away. But there's something better that replaces it. And what replaces that is God knows the way. God will get us through. God will take care of my child. God will look after my grandchild and get him through. We have still the worry, anxiety, but, but it's muted down more and more as we age. And we realize that these feeble little things at the end of our wrists can't do very much in the end. And this, this, this steadily 
shrinking hard drive in our skull can only go so far in working to look after and address the problems that afflict us. So then we keep reading chapter 9 and verse 2. It says, after six days. Now that seems to be just a a noting of a, a time period that they've been around since the Lord Jesus Christ has, has told them these difficult things. But perhaps it's to emphasize the fact that they had six days of moping, of feeling depressed, of wondering, what did I just do? I, I walked away from all that I had. For, for what? He, he's going down to Jerusalem to get killed? No, 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 I don't, I don't believe that. And I don't want to hear that. I really don't want to know what that actually means. And I hope he stops talking about that. Six days. The Lord Jesus Christ watching doubts emerge in and among his brethren. Six days. And then it goes on and it says, he takes with him Peter and James and John and leads them, brings them up into a high mountain apart by themselves. Different opinions on what mountain this is. That does not matter. What matters is that he takes them away to a mountain. Israel was at the foot of a mountain. And they saw a manifestation of Yahweh that for them, together with the blaring trumpet-like sounds and the darkness of the cloud, struck the most terrible fear into them. And they needed that. Because they were stiff-necked, rebellious, and difficult people to get under control. They had to begin with the fear of Yahweh so that there would be any chance of them being moldable to him that they might be his children. And you know what happened with an entire generation of them. They couldn't stop being slaves to sin. Though he had freed them from Egypt with his outstretched arm and brought them into the wilderness through the Red Sea. And so it says, he takes them to this high mountain with all of these echoes of Israel in the wilderness at the mountain. And he was transfigured before them. The corresponding parallel passage in Luke talks about Christ praying and his face became other. It was altered. And you know, brother, reliance on God and prayer change that hard, determined, masculine self-reliance that so often marks and mars a man's face. We're told in Ecclesiastes that wisdom changes a man's face to something that is softer, gentler, more loving, more open, more approachable. Our faces become other because of prayer. Because in prayer we are pouring out. We are totally reliant on God. There are tears. Sometimes there is trembling in the circumstances we find ourselves in. A daily engagement with God in conversation and prayer to Him. It affects us. It softens us so that our hearts are more workable. His face became other. But beyond that, what it says is He was transfigured. Uh, And the word simply means to to be changed into another form. Our hearts are to be transformed, we're told in Romans. They're not made and conformed with worldly and fleshly thinking. He was transfigured before them and his raiment became shining, exceeding white. Uh, What does that remind us of? (laughs) It reminds us of Daniel, doesn't it? At verse 3 of, of chapter 12, And they that be wise 
wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever and we're told in Matthew 13 verse 42 then at the resurrection shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father when Moses came down the mountain Israel was scared because his face shone there was an internal light that came through because of the word of God that had been absorbed in that time with the angel when he was in the mountain and received the stone tablets and for us the time we spend reading. And I know you've read the Bible, those of you that have been in the truth and raised in the truth a long time. You've read it a long time. But I also know, the older we get, the harder it is to concentrate. The harder it is to sit with the Word and remember what we read three verses before. The harder it is to sort of grasp what's going on because the words, even though you've read them so many decades, become a moving mass of things that are difficult to connect together. Just keep doing it. Just spend time with it. And know that God is speaking to you through it. Whatever he says to you, whatever little you take from it, it may be something very simple. Is you being comforted by it. And strengthened by this word. And there he is. Absolutely sparkling with light. The Lord Jesus Christ. And the disciples are not there in dazed wonder. They are in absolute terror. Because flesh. In the presence of God. Or the manifestation of God. Does not feel all kinds of elation. And happy feelings. It knows what it is and is in terror. That's why Israel was in such terror in the presence of God when there was this manifestation on the mountain. That is why when people have met angels in Scripture, it's not to jump up and down and rejoice and say, You're an angel! I always wanted to meet one! People fall on the ground in terror. And for us, as we read these words, it's not just a, an interesting story that we're reading. These are momentous and serious things for us to be quietened by in our, in our spirit, in our mind and hearts, and to take comfort from as we read them. It says, No laundromat on earth could have made his clothes as white and glittering as they were. No one could do that. No dry cleaning job could do that. Or whatever the ancient equivalent was in those days. And there appeared unto him Elijah with Moses. Elijah with Moses. It's as if the law and the prophets are giving their testimony to him that this is the son of God that this is where history is headed that this is what he will look like in his kingdom and they too they too were described as individuals in their in, in a glorious state in Luke which means that he's seeing them as they will appear in the kingdom of God. And so what the disciples were seeing was a manifestation that Christ prayed for for them to strengthen them, to let them know when those swords and when that iron and when those nails are cutting into your flesh, I want you to remember this. I want you to hold on to this. This is why I'm doing this. So you have something to hold on to. And when you want to walk away from the Ecclesia, you'll keep holding on to this and not walk away. And when you want to walk away from your wife, 
You will not walk away from her. And when you want to cut off your kids because they've given you so much pain, you never want to see them again, you won't do it. And when your ecclesia, with all its trouble and all of its drama, is something that is just a stress you don't want to be around, you won't abandon it. Because of this picture. Because this is who you're going to become. And I need you to hold on all the way through. And so these two men appear. And it says in the Luke 9 chapter that they spoke to him. They heard Moses and Elijah speaking to him about his death that he was about to accomplish. His exodus is the Greek word used for death in that passage that he was about to accomplish. Now, I want you to consider something. Every one of you has got to start working on having a good death. What does that mean? Well, in the world in which we live today, people's lives cruise towards and then experience death. And to them, it is the ultimate defeat. It is the ultimate insult to people who live in the flesh and that's all they have. It's a taking away from them of everything that they had. But that's not your death, Christadelphian brother and sister. Yours is a different kind of death. I know we might fear the pain, the suffering, but we're not scared of death because we know when we get past that and it ends, you fall asleep and you're up again at the judgment seat, at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ, in the Sinai Peninsula, trusting in the, the mercy and the forgiveness of God and His Son. So getting to that stage where we're moving into those years just before death, it is not to be filled with disappointment. Filled with all of the things we didn't do, didn't get, didn't have, should have had, all the unfairnesses of, of, of life that, that consume us. Even at that stage, when your time has come, make it the biggest preaching campaign of your life. Share with your kids what you are holding on to, the hope that you have. Not just the ones that are outside and never came in or came in and left, but the ones inside and tell them, listen, Johnny, there is nothing in this life better, bigger, that is more important than God's truth and holding on to it and holding on to your brothers and sisters and serving and helping. All the money, all the career, all the titles. You'll see later on as you get to the end of chapter 9, they're talking foolish nonsense about who's the greater in the kingdom. So even in ecclesial life, even in our community, there can be a horse race of com competition that is unfortunate and not evidence of God at work, but flesh uncontrolled. One brother competing against another brother. One sister doing the same thing with another sister. And so, in your last days, make it about telling people what God has done for you in your life. How God got you through those situations where you know, you know God was at work. It was the only explanation. Make it a time where you, you try to broker peace among your warring children that you're going to leave behind. Make it a time where you apologize for those things you wish you'd done differently with your kids so that they have that memory of dad it was so hard when I was a kid but he told me in those last days 
how differently he wished he'd done things and meant a lot to me. Make it a time to be able to say, son, you know, you said or you did this or that, and it really hurt, but this is how I got through it. Make it a time to underscore the fact that your death is not a defeat, it's a celebration. It is an exodus out of the flesh through that dark place and into God's kingdom according to his mercy. And it's not a thing that happens to you and takes you away. It is an achievement. His death which he would accomplish. We're told in Luke. Every one of us has to be thinking about having a good death. Because that time can change lives. It can resonate and reverberate in the minds of your children, your grandchildren, and your brothers and your sisters. Like nothing you could imagine. And it will stay with them and move them long after you are gone. So the Lord Jesus Christ, when they spoke to him, they were talking to him about the atonement, about the crucifixion, about the things that would be achieved and accomplished by God and the Lord Jesus Christ in his death, where Yahweh, his righteousness, would be elevated, underscored, and declared the righteousness of God, and at the same time, utter obedience, complete love, would be demonstrated. Now do you see how this ties to your death? Our death is also a time of elevating God, of declaring His righteousness, and of also demonstrating an obedient, loving last stage where we give everything for love of our family and our brothers and sisters in Christ goes on. It says cloud overshadowed the Lord speaks out of it and he says look this is my beloved son listen to him listen to him they come down and they're questioning well does the scripture say that Elijah should first come and Peter and the disciples seem to be trying to push away from themselves Christ's words about suffering and difficulty and trouble. Because if Elijah's already come, well, maybe we don't have to go through those things. Or you either. And then Peter says, well, let's build three huts, three, three of those little huts that you saw in, in fields where they were harvesting or where they were making wine out of the grapes. Or what was built by the children of Israel. They call them Sukkot. Every individual one being a Sukkah during the Feast of Tabernacles. When the children of Israel demonstrated we are completely dependent on God, we look through the little branches above us and we can see the stars. This insubstantial little hut is a, a representation of our life and the imaginary securities we have. Right? And so, brothers and sisters, he, he says this, but the Lord Jesus Christ pushes that aside. And then he goes on, and in verse 12 he reminds them again, it is written of the Son of Man that he must suffer many things and be set at naught. At naught. And then he talks about John being like Elijah, akin to Elijah. It's an interesting point that both John the Baptist and Elijah were persecuted by a wicked woman who had, as a husband, a weak king. And you just think about that. Herod, Herodias, Jezebel, Ahab, Elijah, John the Baptist. Just as an interesting point. Moving forward then, what happens is, verse 14 
They come down and there is bedlam because the disciples, the apostles, are unable to heal a child that has been brought. Christ asks, what's going on? And they tell him. The man says, look, I, I brought my, my, my son. Thinking that you, you, your disciples would be able to heal him. They can't do anything. He says, can you do anything? If you can do anything. Can then, verse 22, If thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And then Jesus says to him, If, if you can. So the man is thinking about the limitations of the capacity of the Lord Jesus Christ to help him. Psalm 78 says the signal sin of Israel was that they limited Yahweh. They put boundaries around what he could do in their lives, what he could do for them, with them, in building, in strengthening, in leading and guiding them. And they would not trust in him. So this man, this man is having Israel's struggle. But is, it, but is that Israel's struggle only? Or is it yours and mine too? And so, and so, and he says, look, if you, you can, he says to him, this is not a matter of whether or not I can do something for you. It's a matter of whether you can believe and have faith that God can work in your life. How many times have you panicked when you've seen things fall apart in your life, in your child's life? And your friend, your brother, your sister's life. Where you think all is lost. We're not going to get through this. It's not going to come back together again. And it's never a limitation on God's capacity to help. It is always a limitation of your faith. And so the Lord Jesus Christ says to him, If you can believe, all things are possible to him that believes. And straightway the father of the child cries out and he says, I believe. Please help my unbelief. That's you in the pool of tears you're in that nobody has seen on your knees sobbing out to the Lord God. For your son, who absolutely adores his wife, and she's abandoned him for a more upscale life with someone else. Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. Hold this situation together. Bring a ray of hope. For those kids, help the kids. Give me some kind of wisdom to know what to do how to help and please don't let my son go towards what could happen if he has no hope that's you Lord I believe but help that part of me that struggles to hold on to the belief and the confidence that you will act that you are there that you care that you're involved Help thou mine unbelief. And the Lord looks at this child and he sees it tearing him back and forth. And I wonder if the Lord looks at that child and sees almost a common feeling in himself with the child. He sees the way that the illness, the mental illness is, is pulling him apart and he knew. <laughs> Inside of himself, there was the pull of his nature and the pull of his mind in the other direction. Of his heart, of his dedicated, beautiful mind that Yahweh had been growing since he was a little child. But that struggle, you think he had this, the Holy Spirit power and therefore as a consequence he had an easier time of it? It was worse because he could do more. Because he could do more selfishly. And he had to resist that even more than you and I. 
he looks at that struggle. And out of compassion, he rebukes the illness and it leaves him. The disciples say to him after, how, how come we couldn't do that? And the Lord Jesus Christ, surely connecting it back to what he's been telling them about what he will have to endure and telling them what they would have to endure in picking up their cross. He says, look, you know this kind? It only comes out through prayer and fasting. Through complete and utter reliance on God and belief in Him, demonstrated in open-hearted outpouring of completely vulnerable prayer and self-denial. Self-denial, which is what fasting is all about. And so for us to get through our trouble, for us to get through our problems, for us to be able to address the tragedies that so often assail us, we need to be men and women of prayer. And we need to be men and women who don't allow our flesh to just overtake and our pride and all of the uglinesses of human nature, what it promotes in all of us, not giving it full sway to have its way. And so, so these, these words have a palpable relevance and resonance with us even today though written so many years ago. And so he ends it. After this has happened, in verse 31, for he taught his disciples and said unto them, now as they are passing through Galilee, the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of men, and they shall kill him. And after that he is killed, he shall rise the third day. But they understood not that saying, and they were afraid to ask him. You know, you preach with some of your kids, and you'll start talking about what's happening in Russia, and you can see your child already tensing up, your adult child, who doesn't want to be in the truth. And you'll see that happening, you notice the tense up, but you still say what you have to say. And it's just like Christ talking to his disciples. Oh, that again? Please, I don't want to hear that again. Why is he always telling us this now? They didn't understand. And they were afraid to ask him what that really meant for them. The implications, the changed life, the exposure to continuously um, be vulnerable to evil men who would do all manner of harm to the ecclesia and to their families. So then, brothers and sisters, we have a vision in front of us of the Lord Jesus Christ, glorified, of Moses and Elijah, affirming and engaging with him in conversation about the glorious work that he would do in his death. And there's an exhortation to us to look at that vision, to hold on to it, to cherish it, to be comforted by it. And to see that, like this man, even when we find ourselves panicking at the foot of the mountain, because you hit the heights of spiritual insights, and then you've got to deal with the reality of human nature, and all of its brokenness, all of its weaknesses and frailty, and realize that we, like them, will get through. And please, start thinking about how your death is going to be a good one. One that will help and encourage. Even as you, you withstand, get through with all the sedation, all of the pain management medication, everything that you have to go through. Try to have a good death, like the Lord did. Thank you, brothers and sisters.